Jesus was the eternal Son of God, and he came into this body that was given him. The Catholics talk about the mother of God. Well, isn't Jesus God? Yes. But you're not the mother of God. He is eternal. God was around a long time before Mary came on the scene. She is the mother of the body that was prepared All right, good evening, everyone. Today is November, uh, December 3rd, 2021. Thank you for joining us. So this is the second Human Jesus Conference online. So we hope uh, you are in good health out there, watching us from around the world, in Australia, in uh, Europe, if you're still up. I know it's a bit late for European viewers, but below the uh, below the equator, it's a good time. I think it's afternoon in Australia and South America. So welcome. We hope you're edified. We hope uh, that you come to a greater knowledge and understanding of the human Jesus. We are Restoration Fellowship, the name of our ministry. If you're joining us for the first time, please visit the main website here, focusonthekingdom.org. And you can see many sites here. 
if you're on our normal church site link, uh, we have a Sunday morning service every Sunday, obviously 10.30 a.m. And you can follow us there. Uh, if you're on the Human Jesus site and you're joining us, feel free to comment. And uh, if you have any questions for our speakers as we go along, please type your questions in all caps in the chat. If you're on YouTube or on the Human Jesus site or on the church site here, it's all the same. Just type your questions in all caps. So let's see, the humanjesus.org is the main site for the conference. So you go to the link here and click on conference. And this year's theme is what is man that you make so much of him or pay him any mind? And that's from Psalms 8, Psalms chapter 8. So this goes directly to the identity of the human son of God as well who is called the Son of Man, as we all know. For a list of the schedule and the speakers, click on RF Cox Study, our blog, the Restoration Fellowship blog, and you should be able to see there. So we're starting tonight and we go till tomorrow. Tomorrow will be on all day, pretty much. So we're starting with Sir Anthony, as you can see there. And then tomorrow, December the 4th, uh, we start back at 10 a.m. with Nigel. Paige Jones from the UK, and then Lori at 11 a.m. Note the Eastern Standard Time, so check your local times for your uh, relevant time schedule there. And then Matt Sacra, we're, we'll take a short break here in the afternoon lunch. Matt Sacra at 2 p.m., followed by Tracy from kogmissions.com. Then we take another break, afternoon break, and back in the evening for our final speaker, Ken Laprad and myself at 9 p.m. So please check out that um, Human Jesus website if you're on it. Uh, it'll take you to the conference, and I also put a link to it. All right, so this evening, like I said, we'll start with Sir Anthony. And uh, before we go to his presentation, in Matthew 16, it says that Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon, son, uh, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. So we hope uh, and we pray that this conference brings you that understanding that comes from above. Not so much from us here, although we are facilitators of that. Uh, God uses us and Jesus as their agents. So we're supposed to do a, a job here to preach the gospel, to do the Great Commission. But ultimately, these things are revealed by the Father who is in heaven, who is the God and Father of the Lord Messiah Jesus. So these are very important questions and we hope to have the answers for this and, and know who the Son of Man is, who the, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, really is. Was he just a, quote, mere man? Was he just another prophet like Elijah, Jeremiah? Uh, was he more than that? Many people, as we know, believe that he was God the Son, the second person of a trinity. So we hope that through the presenters here, and I'd like to thank uh, the presenters uh, ahead of time here. This takes a lot of work, as, as you can appreciate, putting together these presentations as, uh, as it does the conference. But we hope that you're edified. We hope that you're challenged if you have not heard some of these things. And please don't believe anything anyone tells you we have a saying here 
check it out for yourself. And that's following the Act 1711 rule. So we hope you do that. You, we hope you're a good Berean, as, as the story in, in Act 17 uh, testifies about. And um, through that, you will be revealed those things that come from God the Father. Okay, so it is my pleasure now to introduce Sir Anthony Buzzard. And if you go back to the, let's see, the schedule here on the speakers, if you click on his name, I did not put his bio here because, well, to be honest, it wouldn't fit. <laughs> such a long bio and such a long list of accomplishments. But if you'd like to find out about Sir Anthony, he actually has a Wikipedia page. And there you will find out about his early life, his education and training and so on. Uh, the founding of Restoration Fellowship, his love of music, and the many books. Uh, by the way, we do have a raffle this year, as we do most of our conferences. Uh, we will have a raffle, so let me get that out of the way and just give you here the email. So if you'd like to enter the raffle to win one of the books in our library, uh, which include obviously books from uh, Sir Anthony, just go to back to the Focus on the Kingdom site, click on books, and we have a, a library here of books by different authors. We have the New Testament with commentary, second edition from Sir Anthony other books from him, and we also have Keegan Chandler's book. So if you'd like to win any of these books, email me at that email, carlos at the humanjesus.org, any of these books, and we will send you a copy no matter where you are in the world. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we'll take care of the shipping. Don't worry about that. So we're drawing for free. This is a free raffle. Again, email me with your name. And uh, that's all for now. You don't have to choose a, a book or a booklet. By the way, these are booklets. We can also send you what happens when we die, who is Jesus, uh, Anthony's first, I believe, first published book, The Doctrine of the Trinity with Charles Hunting. So this is a free uh, drawing, I'm just being corrected here, a drawing, not a raffle, a drawing, a free drawing, and books like Greg Dibel's uh, great book here. Uh, this book has influenced many people, uh, helped many people. Uh, Greg Dibel is from Australia. He's a former uh, Church of Christ pastor. They never told me this in church. So you can... Uh, win a free book from any list here in our short library. All right, and we will do the drawing tomorrow night. So we will draw them tomorrow night. So you have all tonight, again, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. You have all of tonight to send me your details, just your name for now. You have the whole day tomorrow, so we'll go from morning to, to nighttime, as I said, tomorrow. <clears throat> so again, just email me if you want to win a free book from the short library there we have. So, okay, without further ado, I will bring up Anthony. And Anthony is presenting uh, what I probably consider the most important a uh, thing not to belittle the other presenters, but this is really gets to the heart of it. And I think it's if we're going to start, let's start with a bang, right? And um, so this is his paper. By the way, any conference papers, not all the presenters have papers, uh, but any papers will be made available on the blog site. And I'll put the uh, blog site here on the chats, the link but I will post them on this blog, any conference paper. So Anthony will read this evening from his paper. And as you can see there, 
why pre-existence does matter. So he'll read from his paper here. And again, any questions, type them in all caps. Uh, this will go maybe half an hour, 40 minutes or so. And afterwards, I'll open it up to you lovely people out there out there who are watching live and uh anthony will be happy to take any questions so good evening anthony welcome yeah thank you for that introduction very clear i think the miracle of the internet is a huge blessing for us so thank you for taking the time to listen to what we have to say and these are fundamental not sort of side issues that you can argue about occasionally these are Issues of life and death, I would suggest. Thank you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's all yours. All right. Thank you. Okay, so why pre-existence? That's to say the idea that you were somebody before you began to be in the womb of your mother. Why does that matter one way or the other? I'm going to present the idea that it matters critically to all of you listening. So I challenge you with these questions. How do you know? How do you know? that a pre-existing, pre-human Jesus is not a different Jesus from the real Jesus of Scripture. Another Jesus, Paul said, is to be avoided as highly dangerous and misleading and exposed as false Christology. How do you know that a Jesus who began in a pre-life a pre-existing life as an angel, as Jehovah's Witnesses say, or son of God, according to some. How do you know that that Jesus as an angel or pre-existing as God the Son can also be the real Messiah, son of God, coming into existence? I want to stress that meaning of that word there, beginning to exist in Mary, according to Matthew one twenty. There are a number of places in Scripture, I'm adding this now, where the translations are not letting you see the full force of what the Greek says. So look at that coming into existence, beginning to exist in Mary, in her, in the Greek, and I'm using modern Greek pronunciation. Our Greek-speaking listeners will enjoy that. Matthew 1.20. This is one of those great, central, essential questions in the mind of Jesus who I remind you is the best theologian of all. Who do you say I am? As Carlos was just reading in Matthew 16, verse 15. That is the question of all questions. It matters as a matter of life and death. We dare not guess at the question as to who Jesus is. So I would ask you not to put that question out of your mind until you've resolved it by meditation, prayer, and so on. Look at the CSB translation of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Here's what Paul said, as he says it to us all. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach, or if you receive a different spirit, which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted, you're putting it up with it splendidly. You're putting up with it splendidly. Paul here shows his impatience with his own people. You people are not being very smart, Paul is saying. You're putting up with any Jesus that comes to you via preaching. Don't do it. So disagreement, I say, on this issue is not less than confusion over the identity of God and his son. As Dan Gill of 21stCentury.org told us, at a recent Kingdom of God missions conference, Dan Gill said this, we must get God and Jesus right. These, and this is me now, are non-negotiable issues of truth and error. Hebrews 1 verse 1 says that God did not speak in a son in old times. That's to say in Old Testament times. That should settle the issue about the identity of the real and only Son of God easily. It ought to, but it doesn't because people want to produce other texts that contradict that easy idea. So let's see what we come with, what we come to. Now I'm going to quote a number of scholars. Raymond Brown is a very distinguished, not living now, I think, Roman Catholic scholar. I want to quote other people. I didn't make this up. 
Raymond Brown, in his very famous book, The Birth of the Messiah, says this, there is no evidence that Luke had a theology of incarnation with a capital I or pre-existence. Rather, says Raymond Brown, for Luke in Luke 1.35, divine sonship was brought about through the virginal conception or the virginal begetting. Marvelous statement. That's absolutely a hundred, hundredfold right. Luke did not believe in a pre-existent angel or an eternal pre-existing son. And I repeat my point here. Can we not settle on that easy statement of fact? Raymond Brown's comments on Luke actually fully admits that the, quote, so-called orthodox idea of pre-existence is false to the Bible. On Luke 135, Brown makes a fascinating comment on the words, for that reason, in Greek, dioke, for that reason, and the context is that the miracle in Mary, for the reason of the miracle in Mary, Jesus will be called the Son of of God. And then Brown very candidly, most honestly, observes that so called orthodoxy disagrees with Luke. I don't want any of our audience tonight to be disagreeing with Luke. So here's what Luke says quite plainly Raymond Brown says, This Luke 135 has embarrassed many so-called orthodox theologians embarrassed them it's very good to be embarrassed when you're wrong it gets you setting or setting out on the right view it's luke 135 has embarrassed many orthodox theologians because in pre-existence christology a conception by the holy spirit in mary's womb does not bring about the existence of god's son luke is unaware of such a christology Luke does not think of a pre-existing son of God. Luke thinks that the child is totally God's work in new creation. That's from his very famous birth of the Messiah. And I am with Luke, and I want you all to be with Luke. I'm unashamedly trying to persuade you here to agree with Luke and the rest of the scripture. So this is the coming into existence word. The Greek word yanao means, quote, to cause to come into existence. It means to begin to exist or be. Note too how John in his epistles emphasizes this fact about the origin of the son Jesus. First John 5.18 tells us, and this is a key verse in this whole discussion. First John 5.18 tells us that the one who was brought into existence, referring to Jesus, preserves and protects the believers. Did you get that? The one who was brought into existence. That's very clear there. And you will have to look at a number of translations. There is some unfortunate playing with the Greek text in some uh, other manuscripts, but regarding disregarding all that, that is plainly what that says. First John 5.18. So I'm saying this then, the truth of the identity of Jesus must be taught everywhere in scripture if it's taught at all, and it is not. And so to say, well, I think I've got a verse here, one verse or another verse here, which disapproves that, proves absolutely nothing. If you take scripture seriously, you're going to find it everywhere. If we have any regard for the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we must, and I say must, teach all the truth, not just one or two parts of it. In Hebrews 11, 23, Moses was born. Same language exactly. I brought into existence. No problem. Same word, you know. So also was the Son of God. First John 5, 18. I repeat it. Luke 1, 35, Matthew 1, 20. This is a very easy truth about origins. Jesus, to qualify as the second Adam, indeed to qualify as the Messiah, cannot possibly start as non-human. Now I look at this word Gnosticism. I want you to think about that. It is well known that the church quickly departed from truth from the second century on, and Gnosticism was the evil, fatal influence. 
our own, our own Keegan Chandler, among many, has very powerfully documented this truth in his full account in the book which we actually published for him called The God of Jesus in the Light of Christian Dogma. See, especially chapter three, which he calls Another Jesus. And Keegan is here backing my point entirely that Gnosticism is behind the idea, a false idea of pre-existence. Here's some quotes from Keegan's book. The direct apostolic conflict with the Gnostic movement is easily detected in the late first century writings of the Apostle John. The Christians we find utilizing the most peculiar metaphysical tenets of Trinitarians, as they later were, in the first two centuries of the church were in fact the Gnostics. Would you believe it? Trinitarianism, pre-existence, either permanent or otherwise, comes from Gnosticism. It cannot now be denied, Keegan Chandler goes on to say, that the Gnostic schools had a far-reaching effect on the later formation of Christian doctrine. Many of mainstream Christianity's most treasured Christological ideas may in fact be owed to the Gnostics' early pressing of the historical Jesus through the idea of the pre-existing Platonic framework. My goodness, you don't want to wind up believing Platonic Gnostic things. You might just be espousing a form of reincarnation, which is absolutely foreign to the Bible. Exactly so, I say, agreeing with Keegan Chandler. But are we on guard? Are you and I on guard against repeating the same mistake today? It was the Gnostics who used, or rather abused, the Gospel of John to twist the truth about who Jesus is and to promote a non-fully human Jesus. Let us not ever risk believing or supporting this pagan Gnosticism. In fact, John's Gospel was abused, as it still is to this day, and Gnosticism, pagan Gnosticism, was introduced. And it introduced, in fact, a second God person, watch out, by simply capitalizing the word as word in John 1.1. 1, 1. There's a nice article called The Curse of the Capital. I'm adding this now. Take that cup, capital W off the word word in John 1.1. 1, 1. If we say it does not matter, whether a person believes in a pre-existing, pre-human Jesus, if we say that both pre-existence and non-pre-existence are equally good and valid, then we might as well say that truth and error please God and Jesus equally. So my question again, how do we know that we're not falling for the very lie which John called the spirit of Antichrist? That's in 1 John 4, 2 and 2 John 9. These are very stark warnings. These facts demand close attention in the interests of saving truth and fleeing from error, which I know all of our listeners will want to do. Note this quote too, that there is nothing in Matthew's narrative, either in Matthew 1.1 1, 1 or the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, to suggest that he knew of or subscribed to the notion that Christ had existed before his birth. That's from Bart Ehrmann well-known figure in his book, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, page 76. How very unreasonable then it would be for any of us to force this pre-existence pre -existence view on John when it's not in Luke and it's not in Matthew. Well, maybe John then came up with this amazing new idea. I want to stress, a pre-existing pre son is a different Jesus. And this is not a matter of indifference. Do we really want to disagree with Luke and Matthew as to who the true Jesus is? Luke, as you know, wrote more of the New Testament than even Paul. It is an assault, I suggest, on Scripture to find a pre-existing Son of God only in John. If you're doing it only in John, that in itself should be a screaming warning light there. To do this is to follow the Gnostics and other Protestants and Catholics that John 
is to be taken as superior to the other Gospels. Who said that? Why does Billy Graham say that when you get converted, always start by reading the Gospel of John? Why did Luther say the Gospel of John is really much more important than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Those are warning, staggering warning lights for us all. I maintain that the Abrahamic faith people who began around the 1830s recovered a colossal restoration of lost truth about who Jesus is, about his identity as fully human, and about the gospel of the kingdom, it will be to our shame, and I'm addressing this to our audience tonight, it would be to our shame to give this revelation away now. It would be a terrible slap in the face to our predecessors, as well, I think, as to the Bible. So Keegan Chandler's good historical analysis, and I recommend you read his book carefully, of how pagan Gnosticism twisted the Bible, is to be studied carefully. The danger to which Keegan and I are pointing involves, quote, a subtle embrace, as Keegan puts it, a subtle embrace of the docetic Jesus. That's a Jesus who only appears to be human. I explained it there. That is a Jesus who only seems to be, but really, in fact, is not a fully human person. Keegan quotes somebody called Barnes. Quote, John says that we must accept only what John provides. That is only an acknowledgement of the Christ as a real human being. That the Son of God was really a man. That's page 91 of Keegan's book. Keegan italicizes this rightly for emphasis. Orthodoxy says that first, that first in Chalcedon, Jesus is called man. This is later on now. Chalcedon is one of the conferences which come much after the New Testament. And at that conference, which gave birth to orthodoxy, Jesus is called man in the generic sense, human, but not a man. I want you to tell your neighbors who are attending Trinitarian churches or Jehovah's Witnesses churches, are you happy with the idea that Jesus is man but not a man? That form of so-called mistaken orthodoxy, that Jesus has a human nature but does not have a human personal center, that's what your neighbors believe, though they haven't bothered to find out. The author of that remark, a Roman Catholic, critical of so-called orthodoxy, established at the Council of Chalcedon, says that Chalcedon, and I quote, makes a genuine humanity impossible. That's from a book by heart, To Know and Follow Jesus, pages 44 and so on. Okay, now I bring some more witnesses. I'm trying to get some peer review here. Jeffrey Lamp, who was professor, Regis Professor of Theology at Cambridge. Now, I'm not saying that every scholar gets it right, but I'm saying that if you are the Regis Professor of Theology at Oxford or Cambridge, you're likely to be expert in your field in these technical issues. So I quote now, the late Regis Professor of Theology at Cambridge, whose name was Geoffrey Lamp, was one of many who are critical of the Chalcedonian, Trinitarian, or Arian, if you've been a JW, definition of Jesus. He argued that if Jesus pre-existed his human life as God or as an angel, in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, the angel Michael, if that was so and was therefore fully God or fully an angel before he was born, then he could not also be fully human. This, as we've seen, is admitted by the writers quoted above. They confirm that a person who is not a human person cannot be fully human. Jeffrey Lamp describes the unfortunate and confusing implications of the traditional dogma that Jesus is God, or even Michael the Archangel, possessing, quote, impersonal human nature. That's what they believe. What Lamp says applies equally to any form of of pre-existence, be it Trinitarian or Jehovah's Witness Arian view. This is what he says. The Trinitarian concept 
or the JW concept of the pre-existent son reduces the real socially and culturally conditioned personality of Jesus to the metaphys metaphysical abstraction, human nature. According to this Trinitarian or JW Christology, the eternal son assumes a timeless human nature which owes nothing essential to geographical circumstances. It corresponds to nothing in the actual concrete world. Jesus, according to this Trinitarian pre-existence idea or Arian JW idea, in that case, then Jesus Christ has not, after all, come in the flesh. Quotation from God of Spirit by Jeffrey Lamp. Now, we get to the heart of what we're doing tonight. John gave us a deliberate and clear test for recognizing the difference between truth and error. And John warned us, and he's an apostle, he warned us to shun the error and embrace the true and only Jesus. That's the one who is fully human, as John says, who came in the flesh, in Greek, en sarki, who came in the flesh, as per 1 John 4, 2 and 2 John 9. Emphatically, this is not into the flesh. Although Luther had to twist the text there and mistranslate it. No one, I say, can be genuinely human if he is pre-human. So let us all be warned. Going now to John chapter 1, verse 1, and 1 John 1. In John 1, 1, take a pen and cancel the capital W there. Doesn't belong. The word, not capital word, John 1, 1c said was God. But note that it is illegitimate, illegitimate to start with a huge preconception that the word is really capital W-R-D. John was well aware of how his gospel could be confused and abused because he saw this happening. In his first epistle, the first epistle of John, which is a correction, John countered the errors already being made out of his own gospel of John. John said, notice this please carefully in 1 John, six times that he had not said that the Son of God had pre-existed. What he had said is that it was eternal life which, not who, eternal life had pre-existed with the Father. It was, and I quote, eternal life, which was with God. First John 1, verse 2. He called this a that which, a what, six times. You see what John is doing? Emphasizing what he really meant. It wasn't a person that pre-existed with God. It was the idea of eternal life. It was eternal life. Not the Messiah, personally, pre-existing with the Father. This is John's own inspired and clarifying and corrective comment on his earlier words in the Gospel of John. What pre-existed, not who. What pre-existed was the Word, not capital W-R-D. Which, not who, was God in John 1.1c. 1, 1 Jesus, then, is what the Word became in John 1 14. Jesus is what the word became in John 1 14. Okay. In John 1 1 C, at the top of the screen here, God is in emphatic position. The word, not capital W-O-R-D, the word was God himself and not someone else. In other words, the word was God underlined and not someone else. First John tells us that by God in the gospel, John means the Father. That's absolutely right. It is dangerous to propose a non-human, pre-human son of God based on John, twisting him and contradicting the rest of the New Testament. So John 1.1, 1, 1, see the third part of it tells us, that the word in John 1 was, was the Father and no one else. You see, we're dealing with the possibility of adding to the Godhead and breaking 
the unitary monotheism of Scripture. The word was God. The predicate noun God, we're getting a little technical here, as found in John 1.1c, is never ever to be translated as a God. Look at John 1.18 in the same context. Here too, the sentence begins with Theon, God. God, no one has ever seen at any time, or in easier English, no one has ever seen God. Definitely not a God. So don't ever imagine that you have the skills to retranslate that text in John 1, 1, C as a God. That's just wrong. This would be impossible, as equally in 2 John 9, whoever in the name of progress does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God, not a God. So that is really the height of amateur insufficiency, I'm putting it mildly, if you're going to try to retranslate that. This cannot possibly mean does not have a God. An exact parallel to the word was God is the statement that God is spirit, which was wrongly rendered in the King James Version as God is a spirit. Now correct it. Should be God is spirit. He's full of spirit. He's very spiritual. This again shows that the word was God cannot be rendered as the word was a God. We have also God is love. God is light. You wouldn't want to say God is a love or God is a light. Of course not. These are not God is a love or God is a light. No standard modern translation has in John 1, 1, C, the word was a God. It would just be wrong. There are only two New Testament examples of theos, meaning a God. Firstly, where Herod thought of himself as a God and where Paul was thought to be a God when he was unharmed by a snake in Acts 12, 22 and Acts 28, verse 6. If there was a God, Jesus, pre-existing a son, where is that mentioned in the Hebrew Bible? If there was such a son pre-existing, what did he say? What did he do? When was he begotten? Before he was begotten in Mary. He is just not there. So I would strongly suggests that anybody who has been has fallen under the influence of Trinitarianism or Jehovah's Witness Arianism here abandon the idea of a pre-existing Jesus. All right, next paragraph. Move it up a fraction. The word, word. In the Old Testament, word is found 727 times and never once does it mean a person other than God who speaks, of course. Word with a capital W never means that. It never means capital W-O-R-D. So a supposed and imagined pre-existing son disappears. He doesn't exist. The whole idea should be firmly rejected. In John's gospel, word without a capital is God thinking and planning. That is the meaning of word, lowercase, throughout the Old Testament. The capitalizing of word in John 1 simply facilitated, made possible, the appearance of a second God or God. The truth is that, quote, Jesus is what the word became, lowercase word became, not one-to-one -one equal with a pre-existing word person, as Professor Goppel says so nicely in his Theology of the New Testament. In John 1, word with a, a lowercase w is a personification like wisdom, not a person. That is, not a person before Jesus came. When Jesus came and was born, of course, then you have another person than the Father. The capital on word in John 1, 1 is not warranted by the Greek text. It is essential to point out that many scholars recognize that the Bible does not teach the eternal generation of the Son. Many also recognize that John, quote, is as undeviating a witness as any New Testament writer to the unitary, non-Trinitarian, non-Arian monotheism. And you'll find that in those verses. That's from Dr. J.A.T. Robinson's 12 more New Testament studies. Now the critical phrase, in the flesh. Here I'm bringing to you 
John the Apostle's very stark and stern warning. The spirit of Antichrist is to be recognized by this test. Every teacher who does not confess Jesus having come in the flesh, en sarki, not into the flesh, but having come in the flesh, Jesus, the Son of God, came from the womb of his mother, as all humans must and do, except, of course, Adam. Now, Luther, look at the crime scene here, please. Tell your Lutheran friends about this. Luther could not deal with this in flesh in the Johannine test for recognizing the only genuine human Jesus. So Luther forged the Greek of 1 John 4, 2 and 2 John 9. He said, this really must read, come into the flesh. Take careful note of this. So desperate was Luther to make his traditional theology of Jesus fit the Bible. Raymond Brown observes that come into the flesh, as Luther and Calvin wanted it to say. This would be an attempt to force pre-existence and thus incarnation, with a capital I, into the text. Brown, Raymond Brown, thus fully endorses my point that come in the flesh cannot support incarnation and thus does not support a literal pre-existence of any sort. Brown rightly points out that if Scripture supported a pre-existing son, such a son would indeed have come into the flesh, and Luther was willing to alter Scripture to make it fit with his traditional incarnation of a pre-existing Jesus. On no account should we ever be guilty of doing this. This would be tampering with the Bible. Another point. Not going back. There's a perfectly good Greek word I add here for pre-exist in the New Testament, proipachin. Perfectly good word. It's never, ever used of Jesus. There's a perfectly good word for transform. But no text ever says that Jesus was transformed from pre-human to human. There's a perfectly good word for return or go back. But Jesus is nowhere said to return or go back to the Father. <coughs> if you have a translation that says he went back, it's just wrong. Again, a crime scene. The NIV actually gets that wrong. The NIV says that Jesus went back to the Father. That's just a lie. He hadn't been there, you see. He couldn't go back. This should alert us to the tendency in paraphrases sometimes or popular translations like the NIV, this should alert you to the tendency to want to make Jesus fit with the later error of preexistence, which I note was the first step towards the Trinity. So if you're going to support preexistence as an angel or in any form, you're taking one step back to the Trinity. And most of you listening tonight are not keen on that idea. So I repeat my question. How do you know that a pre-existing, pre-human Jesus is not a different and false Jesus to be exposed as anti-Christian and to be avoided as such? All the Bible writers, I say, were obviously so sinian, that's to say non-literal pre-existence Unitarians. The later move away from Jesus to an alien definition of God as triune, or in the case of JWs as two gods in some sense, is one of the most remarkable shifts away from and loss of essential information in the history of miscommunication. Jesus expressed his Unitarian confession of faith, as we know, by asserting that the Father is the only one his true God. So if you're puzzled by any of the detail here, come back to John 17, 3 and John 5, 44. Jesus was a unitary monotheist, obviously. Okay, that's John 5, 44 and John 17, 3. Jesus told the Jews that his God, Jesus' God, was the same one person whom the Jews claimed 
as their God. He actually says that in the Gospel of John. So these Unitarian texts merely repeat the 1,300 New Testament references to God as the equivalent of the Father. Jesus declares himself to be not God, which would, after all, make two gods. But Jesus said he was God's unique human agent. John 17, 3. The simplicity of the confession in John 17, 3 may be illustrated like this. You, singular, father, singular, are, singular, the, singular, only, singular, and inclusive, true, singular, God, singular. So if you have any doubt about who God is, is, God is this really should satisfy you. Standard commentary finds itself obliged to write, and the footnote we leave out there, Carlos, a moment, move on to the sixth page, please. You can read the, the footnote later. Okay. Um, the comment from Luther says, how often may these last solemn, solemn words of Jesus in John 17 have stirred the soul of John? To this corresponds the self-consciousness as childlike as it is simple and clear in its elevation, the victorious rest and peace of this prayer. Luther is doing well here referring to John 17 through 3, which he says is the noblest and purest pearl of devotion in the whole New Testament. For plain and simple as it sounds, so deep, rich, and wide, and this is the negative part of Luther here, that nobody can fathom it. In other words, it's all a mystery if you believe in the Trinity, and yet he admits that in John 17, 3, everything is very simple. And somebody called Spener, a Lutheran, never dared to preach on John 17, 3, because he felt that its true understanding exceeded the ordinary measure of faith, but he loved it so much that he caused it to be read to him three times on the evening before his death. Now, Meyer, another expert on these issue, comments on John 17, 3. Only one, the Father, can be termed absolutely the only true God, the one who is above and over all, Romans 9, 5. Not at the same time Christ, who is not even in 1 John 5, 20, called the true God. Here, Maya correctly says that the Son is in unity with the Father, works as his commissioner, and is his representative and unique agent or shaliach. That's exactly right. Maya then, unfortunately, later loses himself in a befuddling confusion of what he calls the genetic subsistence of the son. But he's already fully committed himself and admitted and conceded the Unitarian statement of Jesus. The famous commentary about Barrett notes that in wisdom literature, Proverbs 11, 9, through knowledge, the righteous will be saved and that the world will eventually be, quote, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And, quote, my people in Hosea are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So to any of our audience tonight, I put this point to you. You may be being destroyed by previous associations for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, verse 6, and Isaiah 5, 13. Clearly, then, the notion of knowledge as the ground of salvation is very widespread. Knowledge and believing are not set against each other, but are correlated. The God whom to know is to have eternal life is the only being who may properly be so described. He, and it must follow, he alone is truly God. There's your Unitarian, unitary monotheistic statement. So I'll finish with this then. Professor Loofs described the process of the early corruption of biblical Christianity. He's talking about the apologists, those people in the second century, church fathers like Justin Martyr. And he says, they laid the foundation for the perversion or corruption of Christianity. German word there, Verkehrung. Our German speakers will understand that and hear the force of that word twisting, perversion, corruption, verkehrung. And that's what happened. They twisted, perverted the Bible into a philosophical teaching. 
Specifically, says Professor Luce, their Christology, their definition of Jesus, definition of Jesus affected the later development disastrously by taking for granted the transfer of the concept of Son of God onto the pre-existing Christ, doing it wrongly, they were the cause of all the Christological problems and arguments of the fourth century. They caused these platonically minded church fathers a shift in the point of departure of Christological thinking. They caused a shift away from the historical real Christ onto the issue of pre-existence. That's where it all went wrong. They thus shifted attention away from the historical, actual life of Jesus, putting the actual life of Jesus into the shadow and promoting instead the capital incarnation of a pre-existing son. They tied Christology to cosmology and could not tie it to soteriology. Okay, the logos then, i.e. a pre-existing Jesus, either in a Trinitarian sense or as an angel, that teaching is not a higher Christology than the customary one. In fact, it lags far behind the genuine appreciation of Christ. According to their teaching, that's the pagan Gnostics, it is no longer God who reveals himself in Christ, but the Logos as a second person with a capital L. The inferior God, watch out, a second God, an inferior God, a God who as God is subordinated to the highest God. In addition, the suppression of the economic Trinitarian ideas by metaphysical, pluralistic concept of the divine triad can be traced to the apologists. That's simply a, a rather heavy way of saying, as Keegan Chandler does, the Gnostics from the second century perverted the faith. And you today, some of you are in danger of not seeing through that scam. So I'm urging you then not to fall for the same lie as was promoted in the second century. Okay, that takes us to the end, I think, of the paper. Am I right? What have we got? There is a final statement there, which I'll read for you, from Colin Brown, Professor Colin Brown. I'm at the end of that paragraph at the top, who spoke at one of our theological conferences many years ago. He was the general editor of the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. We knew him well. He writes this. The crux of the matter lies in how we understand the term Son of God. Exactly. The title Son of God is not in itself an expression of personal deity or the expression of metaphysical, philosophical distinctions within the Godhead. Now note this. Indeed, to be a son of God, one has to be a being who is not God. Show that to your friends. It's a designation. That phrase son of God is a designation for a creature indicating a special relationship with God. In particular, it denotes God's representative, God's vice regent. That's who Jesus is. It is a designation of kingship. That's who Jesus is, the king destined to sit on the throne of David, identifying the king as God's son. That's precisely right. Colin Brown then says this finally, in my view, the term son of God ultimately converges on the term image of God, which is to be understood as God's representative, the one in whom God's spirit dwells and who is given stewardship and authority to act on God's behalf. That's right. It seems to me to be a fundamental mistake. I'm using now the top academic sources to back up what I'm saying. It seems to me a fundamental mistake, and I agree with this, to treat statements in the fourth gospel about the Son and his relationship with the Father as expressions of inner Trinitarian relationships. This would apply equally to the concept that Jesus was a pre-existing angel. This kind of systematic misreading of the fourth gospel seems to underline, underlie rather, to be the basis of much social Trinitarian thinking. And it's the error that has been promoted when it is suggested that Jesus pre-existed as an angel 
i.e. Michael. That's just wrong. Finally, it's a common but patent misreading of the opening of John's Gospel to read it as if it said, in the beginning, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God. That's just wrong. Nor does it say, in the beginning was an angel, and that angel was with God, and that angel was somehow a second God. It's equally false. What has happened here, Colin Brown says finally, is the substitution of son for word, and that should have no capital there, the Greek logos, which is not another person than the father. Thereby the son is catastrophically, I add, made a member of the Godhead, which existed from the beginning. That's from his article that you can look up. So I think that takes us to the end of our paper. I hope that I've provoked you to think about these issues deeply and make sure you have the right Jesus, who is not a pre-existing angel and certainly not a pre-existing member of a triune God. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anthony, for that. Okay. And um, we'll take some questions here. I'll let you have a break there, a drink of water if you have it there. And while you take a breather, I'll just direct people. Again, these papers will be made available uh, after the conference. Once again, on the blog, I'll put it again in the chat, the RF Bible study blog. And also, Anthony has an article. We have many articles. Just go on the focus on the kingdom.org, click on articles. And there's an article called Testing for Truth A Critical Question About Your Creed, as a supplement to this uh, presentation from Anthony. And there you have it. And I'll put it in the chat. So, due to time constraints, obviously. Uh, we could not add it to the presentation from Anthony, but he very much would like you to take a look at that if you have time, please. And uh, again, I'll put it, yep, I put it in the chat there. So, okie doke, let's see, we'll take uh, some questions here. Let me just bring up, thanks everyone, a uh, very busy chat. I see on the chatting there. Thank you to Kingdom of God for moderating the chat as usual, keeping everyone under control. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's see, Anthony. We have a couple of questions. Let me yeah. get this one up. What is the shortest explanation to tell folks who hmm. ask about John 17, 5 yeah. regarding Jesus' supposed pre-existence it's a great question simple answer in that very chapter john 17 if you go to the end of the chapter jesus said that he has already given the same glory to christians who weren't even born at that point the glory that you've given me verse 22 the glory that you father have given to me jesus i jesus have given to them they weren't even born yet. So this is glory in promise, not glory in fact, so that they may be one, all of the Christians throughout all time, just as we are one. So in verse 24, I desire that those also whom you have given me, and he's looking at the whole range of Christians that would become Christians, those whom you've given me may be with me where I will be. That means, of course, where I am in the future, so that they can see my glory in the kingdom, which you have given me. I actually hadn't received it yet, because you loved me, Father, before the foundation of the world. So that is glory in prospect and promise, not in actuality, in that very same chapter. So I'm glad you asked that question. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. We will move to the next question here. Mm -hmm. I've changed my belief on John 6, 62 a few times. Yes. I believe now that it has to do with Jesus' resurrection on earth. I see. I think it's valid. I'd be mm -hmm. interested 
on your take on this one, Anthony. So let's yep. have a look at the... Then what if you were to see the Son of Man mm -hmm. ascending to where he yep. was before? Okay, it's an excellent question. My suggestion would be to you, that the key is in the phrase Son of Man, human being. What if you were to see the human being ascending to where he was before. So if you take that quite literally, that would be a human being in heaven before he's born. I think that is self-evidently false. So what if you were to see the human being, the son of man, ascending to where he was before? Where was he before? According to Daniel, he was in heaven in the future, in a vision. So what if you were to see that vision of Daniel 7 about the Son of Man going to be fulfilled when, in fact, Jesus did ascend, as you know? So the key there is you're defining something about the human being. So this cannot possibly be a reference to a pre-existing angel, much less to a pre-existing God figure. It's a vision of the Son of Man found in Daniel. And Jesus did, in fact, ascend to the heavens, as we know, after his death and resurrection. I think that's probably easier, but, you know, that is a, a hard text, if you like. All right. Next one. Mm -hmm. um, many Trinitarians I've yes. communicated with online, especially mm. YouTube, more or less tell me that I'm going to yes. hell. Yes. How to more or less? <laughs> yes. or eternal damnation yeah. because I do not believe the deity of Jesus yes. that Jesus is God this I believe is their delusion Yes. do you believe that 2 Thessalonians 2 mm -hmm. verses 9 to 12 mm -hmm. especially verse 11 in some way refers to them <laughs> yeah no I, I've got that point and, and I've been told I've, I've used this uh, publicly it's humorous we were written a, a tough email one day saying Anthony your narrow hips are going to burn in eternal, tortured hellfire forever. I just say that is absolutely predictable. Don't be shocked by that. Now, I'm not able to explain why God has allowed, why God and Jesus have allowed this degree of scam. All I know is that people, once they join a group, like the Watchtower or like the Church of England, they are going to believe what the group teaches. That's the way people are. It's just a human uh, failing. So I wouldn't be put out by that. You don't have to deal with all of these people if they're going to be nasty to you. But I have found that some, if you work with them slowly and gently and persistently, they may eventually change their minds. So don't give up. And you want to ask them, how many Yahwehs are you proposing? And they'll say one. And you say, well, that's interesting. I have one Yahweh. So then you're saying the Father is Yahweh, that Jesus is Yahweh, and the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. How many is that? One. Well, at that point, your child of three or four or five will not be able to comprehend. So it's an absolute abuse of easy language. And that's what Trinitarianism is. You would be interested in reading the book by Andrews Norton at Harvard, Reasons for not believing in the arguments of the Trinitarians by Andrews Norton, N-O-R-T-O-N. Fascinating, because this very bright man saw through the Trinity. Let me finally say this to you. Sir Isaac Newton, John Milton, and John Locke, certainly the brightest brains of their century, they were vigorous non-Trinitarians. That may help you. We're not some weird cult has come up with something new. Not at all. Jesus was a Unitarian because of the creed which he recited, the Jewish creed. So you have to go patiently. And if you do this a small amount of time every day, you'll get more and more skilled at doing it effectively. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We have one, yeah. a couple more questions, okay. then we'll wrap up for Good. tonight. Thank you. How is Jesus the firstborn of all creation if he is not the first created yeah. being? Well, I think he's the firstborn of the new creation. That's the first one of the new creation. He's obviously not the firstborn of the Genesis creation. I would simply refer you to Colossians 1, 
where there's a very interesting change of verb tense there. Talking about Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God. That sounds like Adam. He's the new Adam. We're talking about the new creation. He's the image of the visible God, the firstborn of all creation. For because of him, I would translate that with top authorities, because of him, all things in heaven and on earth, Genesis 1, were created. Things visible and invisible, thrones and so on. All things have been created. Most interesting. Uh, it is Nigel Turner, who we also knew and had a great respect for, who writing in a book called Grammatical Insights into the New Testament, points out that the first verb there is a reference to the first creation in him. And the expositor's Bible commentary translates that rightly, because of him. All things in heaven were created. That's an aorist tense. Then Paul very subtly refers to the new creation. All things in the new creation have been created and are being created, is the sense there. Through him, and that's certainly true, through Jesus, the new creation is in full swing, and all of that is for him. But the Genesis creation was because of him. So he's the firstborn of many brothers, isn't he? The many brothers have a sort of parallel with him. He's the top one in that category, but nothing to do with pre-existing his birth. By the way, you say to your friends, how can you be before you are? How can you be older than your own grandfather? That's just into the, into the world of nonsense. We're talking about hot ice cubes, married bachelors, and what's the other one? Married bachelors, hot ice cubes, and square circles. Your children will not be very interested in your faith unless you can explain it better than that. Okay. All right. Um, mm -hmm. A couple more, Anthony. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. For I'm yeah. um, sorry if I don't get to your question or comment. Can you comment on this? This is not so much a question, but no indefinite articles in Greek, mm -hmm. only definite. Well, yes, there's no indefinite article, but if it's not a definite article, then it's the equivalent of indefinite. So the word is the one word. The Satan means the one Satan we all recognize. A Satan would just be the absence of an article there. So if there isn't an article in English, that's the equivalent of a Satan. You can have many Satans. A Satan can be an enemy of yours. But the Satan with the definite article tells you we're pointing to the one that we all recognize. So the fact that there's no indefinite article simply means that in English, we would say an or a. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. One more question yes. here. And Anthony, ultimately, why does all <laughs> this matter? Well, because if you don't think it matters, you're saying to God, I don't care about the truth. That view is as good as that view. It matters as a matter of salvation. I'm not going to decide who's going to be saved in the ultimate sense, because I don't know how responsible you may be. But don't tell me that John, in his epistle, wasn't absolutely for real when he said, you'd better get this right. You'd better define, as Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Oh, well, who cares? What? God is the one who makes the rules, not I. If God wants you to understand Jesus as the Son of God, beginning in the womb of his mother, and he insists on that, he's only asking you to believe the truth of Scripture. At that point, we don't have the option of saying, I don't believe it. If you don't see it yet, study it, pray, and then you will get the reality of truth. So that famous verse that somebody alluded to in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says there, Paul said, because they did not have a love of the truth in order to be saved. Notice he didn't say because they didn't have a love of the truth in order to be clever, in order to be intellectual, a love of the truth, which means a hatred of error in order to be saved. If you're not going to have that attitude, all right, God will give you over to a spirit of delusion and you'll wind up believing all sorts of chaos. Don't go there. 
the truth is all important. All right. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that presentation. I'll let you go. It's getting a bit late here, too. So thank you for that once again. Please check out this other article Anthony would like you to read, Testing for Truth, a critical question about your creed. So this is a supplement to his uh, paper. Once again, all conference papers or any conference papers um, <clears throat> will be uploaded later on the RF blog. This is the blog once again. I put the link in there. So. And in this blog, at the moment, you will find other articles, but this is the important one, which is the schedule plus speakers. So you can find out what is going on. We have a drawing, a free drawing for books from our library. If you go to the focusonthekingdom.org site, go on the link to books. So if you email your name, I'll put the email here. Use this email. Email your name only. No, no other information. No bank accounts, no bank details, no zip code, anything. So we'll have a free drawing probably tomorrow night. So the last uh, presentation. If And for your chance to win for free any of the books here, from Anthony and others, including Keegan Chandler's The God of Jesus, which is about to go, if not already out of print, by the way. So <clears throat> uh, Jesus, Jesus was, uh, sorry, Anthony's Jesus was not a Trinitarian. And many other books, just go to the list. There's Greg Dibel's book. For your chance to win any of these books, uh, Anthony, I think, will sign his. So if you want any of his books, he'll even sign it for you, I think. So <clears throat> that's an added bonus. All free. Email me just your name. You'll be in a draw. And I'll do that tomorrow night. And then we'll follow up if you win, of course. So uh, let's see. Before we go... So thanks a lot. I mean, the chat is is very active, very full. Thank you so much for being here. I'll just share some quick comments here. Right on, Sir Anthony. Thank you there. Uh, Sharon, Sharon is a faithful viewer. Let me get this in a bigger form here. So actually, let's do classic. Thanks so much, Sharon. Uh, Daniel T. Good point, Sir Anthony. Uh, let's see. Thanks for that. Mm. The Unitarian Christian Outreach says Gnosticism is horrible. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's very horrible. And Unitarian Christian Outreach is northwest of England? Hey. Wow, you must be up pretty, uh, what is that, is it 1 a.m. over there? <laughs> Thanks a lot for staying up for this. We appreciate it. Uh, let's see, just a couple of, Daniel T says, loud and clear, Sir Anthony. Uh, let's see, just trying to scroll through all the comments here. Very busy. Uh, let's see. We have uh, maybe a Muslim viewer there, Salam. So we do have a, a large following in the Muslim world. So a lot of friends. Uh, unfortunately, not uh, brothers or sisters in Christ, but... Many, obviously, uh, Muslims are Unitarians, non-Trinitarians. So, so they really appreciate uh, Anthony's work and the work of others. So we thank you for watching this. Uh, let's see. Yes, and uh, many other comments as well. All right. So... Uh, 
Okay, we'll wrap it up there. Once again, if you have any uh, questions about the schedule, let me put it up here before we leave. Okay, so we'll be back tomorrow morning. There you have it. We'll start with Nigel Page Jones. He's in England as well, in Liverpool, actually. And he'll, his title, as you can see there, The Pagan Trinity. A look at some of the pagan origins of the Trinity, how it has been used as a means to introduce further pagan culture into the church today, such as Christmas. The winter solstice has always been a significant date in the pagan calendar as a time to celebrate the rebirth of its false gods. Today, the entire world unknowingly still celebrates the same festival of so-called divine birth due to the false doctrine that Jesus is God. <laughs> wow. So, yes, uh, Nigel is one of few people, a few Christians, I should say, that are that are not uh, very comfortable with the whole Christmas uh, issue. So, okie doke. All right, so we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. We'll be back once again, 10 a.m. And again, if, if you'd like to put your name for the free draw, any of our books, again, email me at that site. So until we meet again, thanks for watching.